Take your Bibles, if you would, tonight. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, we'll start in verse 24 and uh, read down to the end of the chapter. And I'm going to preach about myself tonight. I'll be the main theme of the message tonight. You will all will bow to me. Kiss your big toe. What's that? Kiss your big toe. Yeah, kiss my big toe. <laughs> you don't want to repeat. Second Timothy chapter 2, starting verse 24. <clears throat> we'll read down to 26. And this is what it says. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. That's me. Right? <laughs> be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. There you go. Perfect husband. Right, babe? Uh, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And so again, verse 24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, have to teach patient meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful, Lord, we pray. Lord, that you help us tonight. And uh, Lord, as I mentioned, this is somewhat a, 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 a message about the pastor. And uh, Lord, help us to uh, help us to be on one page. And uh, Lord, help this uh, message tonight to help us to understand the position of the pastor. And uh, so bless us now, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So tonight, as the scripture suggests, we're going to look those few uh, first couple verses there that I reread. We're going to look at the, the pastor's position in the church, so to speak. And I, I I think I'm drawing this down quite a bit because it's talking about the servant of the Lord. So we could probably expand this even to those that are serving the Lord. Uh, there's many qualities that a pastor has that it would be the same or it would be good for anybody that's uh, following the Lord, serving the Lord. Uh, that they would have those same kinds uh, of qualities. Uh, the pastor's position, though, uh, can be a thankless position. Christy and I have said some of our best times in the ministry was when we were not uh, pastoring a church. When I wasn't pastoring and she was the first lady, uh, we had a, a much better time being an assistant in an assistant role, did we not? Is that not true? I mean, you wouldn't deny it, would you? We had a much better time being in the role of an assistant and having the senior pastor kind of uh, take the brunt of all the blame for anything that uh, he wanted us to do, we went ahead and did, and tried to do the best that he said, uh, uh, that he told us to do. And uh, if people didn't like it, all we had to do is go say, just say, go see the pastor. Don't like it, go see the pastor. And then when they turned around, you stick your tongue out at it. Anyway, so, so the pastor's position can be a thankless position. Uh, my dad, uh, before his son became a pastor, used to say, used to say about pastors, uh, they're too lazy to work and too chicken to steal. And that's a cleaned up uh, saying from him. Um, he used to say a little bit worse than that. And uh, so too lazy to work, too chicken to steal. And, and the criticism that goes with the position of pastor really is endless. No matter the decision someone gets, uh, their hurt, feelings hurt. In other words, no matter what happens, no matter what the pastor decides, someone is always going to get their feelings hurt. There's always going to be an opposing side. And uh, much of this is because many don't understand the position of a pastor. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit tonight. And so uh, the first thing we need to realize, pastor is a position... It, it, it's a position with a purpose. I have, believe it or not, I have a purpose here. I have a purpose. There's, there's a particular purpose that I have as pastor. There's a particular purpose that a pastor has, no matter what church you go to. They, have, they serve a purpose. You might say, well, what is that? Well, look at verse 24 again. It says, And the servant Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, meekness, instructing those that oppose uh, themselves. And so, uh, there are some verses, even in the very same chapter, that help one realize the purpose of, of a pastor in the church. Uh, turn back to, uh, is it verse 3? 
Look at verse 3 in chapter 2. Now remember, this is Paul talking to Timothy, uh, who is pastoring a church, and uh, he's giving uh, Timothy encouragement and, uh, and kind of telling him his role and the things that he's got to expect and the, uh, the characteristics that he needs to develop. And so here we go in, in verse uh, 3. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So it says, endure hardness as a good soldier. So obvious, it's obvious what a soldier is. They're equipped to do war, and, uh, and many times uh, there are soldiers that have to lead. And so they're equipped to do war and lead others into war. And you might say, well, what, what, are we, what are we warring against? Well, uh, you know, the, the world, yes, but we really know the big picture. That's one of the keys uh, about this world, one of the keys that helps us uh, when we're fighting to realize that, you know what, uh, it's much bigger than what this world is. We're talking about the depth. Amen. Uh, when we, uh, when, stay right there, but when you go over to uh, Ephesians, and it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, that it says, Wherein in time past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so we can say this is a wicked world, but we know who's behind the wickedness. Well, it, yes, it takes people to, to do wickedness, but we know who's behind those people. Just like what that Ephesians chapter 2, uh, again it says, it says, uh, uh, it says that they now worketh, uh, the, that spirit, the spirit of the devil, now worketh in the children of disobedience. Amen. And so it sure does help to realize uh, that the picture is much bigger than many times than what we think. It's not just that we're in a wicked world. It's that that this world marches to the tune uh, of a leader, a faithful leader, and he's a wicked leader. And of course, we're talking about the death of uh, the devil. And so, when it's talking, when Paul's talking to Timothy about enduring hardness as a good soldier, that's one of the roles that a, a pastor plays. He's he's a soldier, just like. Just like the enlisted, but he's in a position maybe to lead, uh, to lead the enlisted uh, folks. You see, uh, we're looking at verse six in back there where we're at in Second uh, Timothy, and when I say Second Timothy chapter two, and uh, look at verse uh, verse six, verse six of what it says. Second Second Timothy chapter two, <clears throat> in verse six it says. The husband and men that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Now, I'm not even going to get into the, the fruits and all that, but what I want you to realize is that a pastor is a husbandman as well. Now, what is a husbandman? Well, when you, when you study through the Bible and you go through there and you start seeing that word, it starts to connect it with something. Many times it's with a vineyard or a farm field. And so really what a husbandman is, is like a farmer, a cultivator, or a tiller. And this to these verses in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. It says, remember them which have rule over you. Now, I know this is a tribulational passage, but it says, remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering into their conversation. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account, that they uh, do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So when you read these, it tells you kind of a specific purpose for a pastor. That verse, uh, that verse 7 says, remember them which have rule over you. So, so it does show us that a pastor is given a position, not to rule, but to lead, and, and yes, you know, there is going to be some following, but what I'm saying is, verse 7, it, it, it shows us that, that, you know, the pastor has a specific purpose. Verse 17 talks about, obey them that have a rule over you, submit yourselves for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And I love how it also says, back in verse 7, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And so, so it's amazing when you look up that word conversation. 
that it says follow them, follow them because they're preaching the word to you, but also follow, you know, their, their conversation will lead you as well. And did you know many places in the in the, the New Testament, when you look up the word conversation, it's not talking about a verbal conversation. Many times it's talking about walking your talk. And so it says, follow a man who walks their talk, you see. And, and so when you think about it, we are to be a vine in a sense. And, and when you start to think about all that, uh, all it talks about vines and all that, we are to be a vine, and despite the entanglements, we are to produce fruit. The entanglements in the world and all that. And so, so I, thought, I hope you're kind of getting a sense of what a pastor position is. That he is to be a leader. He is to be like a soldier. And, and he's to be, he, he leads by demonstration. Amen. So a pastor, again, is a position with a purpose. Uh, it's also, it, a pastor is, is a placed position. What do you mean by that? Well, in other words, what I'm saying is it's ordained by God. Hey Amen. I, I fully understand the position of pastor is filled by, by common, ordinary, oxygen-breathing, red-blooded, uh, put one pant leg on at a time, type man. And that they're not perfect. And so, but yet they are, and, and I still believe this. I believe there's a, a, a lot of uh, men who are disgruntled when you start talking about being a God-called man. To do a specific purpose. But I do believe that God calls pastors. Anybody disagree with that? God calls pastors. Amen. Now, I believe you know, a, lot of, a lot of men can preach. You know, uh, Brother Vessel, who was here with us Friday night, um, he was giving us testimony, standing out there and talking to us and encouraging us after Friday night preaching. And, of course, we had a meal here and whatnot. And uh, after Friday night preaching, and he stood there. And he goes, now, no, I'm, I'm not called to be a pastor, but I, I am called to preach. I, or, or I should say, he says, I do preach. I come to street preach and whatnot and whatnot. But he said, I'm not like, and I, I forget where he was going with this, but he was talking about the difference between someone that preaches and someone that actually is called a pastor and preach. And he, there's, he, 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 he puts a line. He makes a, there's a difference. And, and look at uh, Ephesians. Turn to Ephesians, if you would. Back to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> and look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Because there is a specific call to pastors. It says, uh, back up to verse 10, He that descended the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. I even had it on that list. I added to God's word. I put in there greeters and and, and um, what did I put in there? Janitors and oh, I can't even read it now. My my email gets smears. Exhorters and ushers and encouragers and bus workers and bus captains and bus drivers. Now, I didn't really add to the word, to the word but there are other calls, other things that we can do. Uh, maybe not uh, a specific call like those, but there are other things that we do, duties that we do in the church. But you look at verse 11 again, it says, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. And what are the, what's the purpose? What's their purpose? Look at what verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints. So God gives these men to the local church for a reason. And, and we see what that reason is. Look at, look at what verse 14 and 15 says. There's an end result. There's something we're aiming for. Did you know there's something we're aiming for here at the church? Yes, I understand that we want to get more people saved, right? We want to knock doors. We want to reach more people. And if we could get more people to come to church, that'd be wonderful too. But is that the end game? Is that what we're we're all aiming for? No. Look at what, what look at what verse 14 says. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning and craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto, uh, into him in all things, 
which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, uh, uh, compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, uh, maketh increase the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Did you know what we're supposed to do? Is yes, we're supposed to grow as a church, but you know what the end game is? The end goal is that we're to be ready for Christ to come. That in the probably near future, that the Lord someday will come and call us out of this mess. Amen. And whether we're a congregation of 10 or 10,000, I mean, we're to be ready. You see what I'm saying? And so, so understand that a pastor is just a man. But as a God called man, not to be not to be stated as pride, but as fact. And why God chooses who He does, I do not know. I only know He calls, and and without that call, eventually will come calamity. In other words, without without a, a a God called man to lead a group of people, calamity will exist. I mean, it even happens when there is a God called man. Amen. Climate at time happens. So, so again, pastors they place a position, and then also the office of pastor it can be a precarious position. What do you mean by that? Well, precarious. I looked it up. It, it means depending on the will or pleasure of another. In a precarious position, in my position, there are really only two wills that can impact my call. Did you know that? It's God's and my own. Amen. And so what can happen is carelessness of the call. Carelessness. I have no doubt there are many men in the office of pastor who have never been called to bring shade to the office. You know, I've, I've, I've witnessed it myself. I went to Bible college and I've heard men come, and I wasn't even in the right Bible college at the time, but I heard men come who gave a testimony of, well, their testimony was, well, I'm here because God called me to come here. No, that wasn't the testimony. You know what the testimony was? I came because I had nothing better to do. I came because, and I, I still remember this like yesterday. A guy got up in one of our classes, and the, the professor gave us an opportunity to kind of stand up, introduce ourselves, and, and tell basically why we were there. And even at that time, I knew there was something about me going to Bible college that I didn't just go on my own. I didn't go because I didn't have anything better to do. And, and I don't tell people this uh, to get people to feel sorry for me or to be braggadocious, but I had a very good job. I had a really good job. I had a really, really, really good job when I, when I left that job to go into ministry, to go to uh, Bible college. And, and so what I'm getting at is what was amazing is when mother get that baby out of here yeah shut that head up so anyway um, so as we're in class a, a professor a professor gives us an opportunity to kind of stand and tell who we are and why we're there and so I gave my testimony you know that I felt the Lord was leading me here to continue on and to go into some form of, of full-time ministry, you know, and I wouldn't have done it on my own, and I didn't go into having a good job and getting $100,000 a year in 1997, I think was my last year, I was making like, I made 103000 that year, I didn't go into any of that, but I just said, I'm here because the Lord loved me. And as we kind of went through, there was guys that got up, and one guy in particular got up and he said, well, I lost my job at the fast food place, and we lost our house, so we had to move in with the old lady's mom and dad, and we had six kids, and her mom and dad got tired of us, and basically booted us out. So he said, here I am, no job, six kids, and not knowing what to do. And so I thought, why not go to Bible college? And I'm kidding, I'm not kidding. That is exactly how he said it. Now, he might not have said the old lady, but he was pretty redneckish, and it was amazing. I was just, I was appalled. 
I mean, not, I mean, not in a uppity way, but I just couldn't believe it. That on a whim like that, he would go to college, go to a Bible college. And, and he wasn't the only one. There was more than one like that. And, and so what I'm getting at is when I think about that, and, and in my position, as I said, there are really only two wills that can impact my call, God's and my own. And, and carelessness, carelessness of that call, I have no doubt, just as I said, there are many men in the office of pastor uh, who have never been called and bring shame to the office. I have no doubt there have been men called who have been careless with their call and have fallen into some form of wickedness. You know, I, and, and I, I, I told often, I already mentioned that, the, that of my profession before I became pastor, and I don't do it to brag, I just tell you what my position is. This is where I came from. I didn't, I didn't come here, I didn't, I didn't decide to be a, become a pastor because I didn't have anything better to do. Amen. Matter of fact, I've told Christine many times when we change colleges, I said, you know, if, if I'll be fine if God releases me and we go back home. I'll go back home and make all kinds of money and be the best, uh, the best lay person in the church that I can be. Didn't I say that? I said, I have no problem with packing stuff up right now because we knew we weren't in the right Bible college. And I didn't know what God wanted us to do at that time. But I knew it wasn't in the right Bible college. And I said, I said, we need to start praying. And I said, I said, I have no problem right now going home. And I know I can, you know, go back to work doing what I was doing and make money hand over fist and we'll be the best lay people we can be and be a blessing to some church somewhere. And of course, God wasn't content with me doing that. And so what we ended up doing, of course, is finding uh, the right church, you see. And... And I remember when I left, I've told this story many times, that when I left, uh, Chad was, uh, he, was a, he was a younger guy that I worked with, and we were running cranes and really enjoying what we were doing. And, and, he, and when I told him that I was leaving, he couldn't believe it. And he goes, you're never going to be happy going, going to Bible college and going into whatever that is you're going into. He said, you love running cranes way too much. He said, you'll never be happy. And I said, Chad, I don't know how to explain this to you, but if I'm doing what God wants me to do, I'll be happy. Amen. No matter what, I'll be happy. And, and just as I said, when you think about a pastor and what they do, people said, you know, I would, I would put up with what uh, you put up with in the ministry for two seconds. I felt that way at times, too. I mean, when you have a guy, when you're standing out on a street corner and you're preaching with a sign that says, for whosoever shall call upon him, work shall be saved. I mean, all you're doing is giving an innocent gospel message out there. And some guy comes over and threatens that he's going to knock your head off. And so then you've got to try to rein yourself in and not want to knock his head off. You know, and then he sits there and ridicules you and tries to, and, and is watching out of the corner of his eye as this couple is, is, uh, is egging him on through the restaurant window. And you got to just sit there. And you have to maintain your cool. And you have to hold your voice back as they come marching across the road. You know, really? Stop. Stop. Josh comes just <laughs> running across like a freight train. <laughs> Just wait, just stop. We're gonna we'll, we'll call 911, we'll call the police. And so, and so what I, I I mean, I've been lied to, I've been spit on, I've been stole from, I've been cursed at, I've been threatened, just about everything you can think of. Amen. And and so so just like what Chad said to me, you're not gonna like it. I will if I'm called to. I wouldn't take that stuff for a second. You would if you were told to. You would if you were called. Amen. And then, and then, of course, we look at the characteristics of the call. Did you notice that? That it says that. Go back to 2 Timothy. And uh, look what it says. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And look what it says. And a certain Lord must not strive. I didn't punch him. 
Amen. I stood my ground, but I didn't swing at him. Now he swung at me. He knocked the sign on my hand, but I didn't swing back. And so, so as the servant Lord must not strive, this is verse 24, but be gentle unto all men and apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Have you ever thought about that? When we're down there street preaching, that they may be showing you opposition, but you know what they're really opposing is themselves. Amen. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that there's something in us that tells us there's something more. And what happens is, is when they turn against the gospel message or someone who's preaching the gospel message, it's just like what Paul says here. They're opposing themselves. And you know what? It takes a special kind of love to, to, to show kindness to people who oppose themselves when actually you're the target. Amen. Paisley and I were out here talking. And I tried to explain to her some of the decisions that a pastor makes or a Christian makes can be looked at by the world as unloving and uncaring. But I said, what you have to do is look deeper into it and realize that, you know what? Many times those who have to take a stand with God are showing more love to those people that they have to stand against than the world who wants to, with open arms, embrace them and their wickedness. Amen? It takes a lot more love and a lot more guts to do it God's way. You see? And so, so what I'm getting at is, is this is servants. Yes, we can say this can be for a pastor, but it's for Christians just as well. Every one of you have to have these same characteristics. The servant of the Lord must not strive, must be gentle. It's like being a, you know, a, a loving person. In other words, pastor needs to be a loving man. Verse, in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 24, it says, My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have you ever thought about that? When you, have you ever read 1 Corinthians? Do you realize that it's, it's Paul chewing on this church for 16 chapters. All the things that they're doing wrong, he takes them through everything. He says, he says, you're profaning the Lord's Supper. You're doing that wrong. You got a, a man in your church who's who's got a relationship with his, I don't know exactly how it is, but it's your his his father's wife. You need to put him out of the church, 1 Corinthians 5. You got, you got church members suing church members, 1 Corinthians 6. You got, you know, he's, he's even answering some of their questions about when is it the right time to touch a, for a man to touch a woman. You know, and he's got to tell them, keep their hands to themselves. You see. <laughs> all of that. And yet, through all of that, at the end of 1 Corinthians 16, he says, my love be with you. After he takes them through all that, my love be with you in all, uh, or my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know what? That, that's a loving man. Now, I had, a, I had a very loving pastor, Pastor Woods. He was a loving man. Now, he, you know, you could get on his wrong side. And there was a couple times I did as an assistant, unknowingly get on his wrong side. And he could be he could be crude, he could be rough. But you know what? He always knew he loved you. Didn't he? He always loved us. He was a he was a man of great love, a great pastor. And so he was a loving man. It also says there, uh, it says, and the servant Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men apt to teach. Must be a gentle man. You see. And of course, it talks about the end there. A uh, pastor needs to be a faithful man. You know, faithfulness is, is required in order to lead. And I thought about this verse when I thought about that. Is in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, uh, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I thought just recently, 
that, that here's Paul, he's, he's a leader, and he's telling the group to follow him. But you know what he always did? He kept his eyes on Christ. Now, you can, you can jump in line and you can follow, but he ain't going to look back to see who's following. Amen. All he told them is follow me. You know, as I follow Christ. And I got to thinking about that, and I, and I thought, you know, one of the greatest reasons why you need to keep your eye on, eye on Christ is because if you look back to see if anybody's following, what if they're not? You're following Christ. You're doing what you're supposed to do. But if you look back and they're not following, did you know that's a discouragement? And, and it can almost get you to the point where you stop following Christ. And so when I think about that, I, I can almost think of the, the, how would you say it, the, the kind of the mentality that Paul would have had. Where he's saying, be followers of me, but him also saying, but don't think I'm going to be counting those that are following. And don't, be, don't think that I'm going to be watching out for you and make sure you're following me. You know, what he basically say is, hook your wagon on, and I'll pull you, but I'm not looking back. Because I'm following Christ. And so that's almost kind of a great, to me, that was a great ministry reminder. That, you know, um, I can be following Christ and encourage people to follow me as I follow Christ. And hopefully lead them long enough where they can follow on their own. But I'm surely not going to get wrapped up into looking back and seeing who's following and who's not. It's kind of like being on Twitter, where you can, you can get wrapped up into seeing how many followers you have. Amen. And, and I even caught myself doing this, hmm, they stopped following me. I wonder, what's their problem? You know, you know I, had, I had 235 followers. Now I have only have 234 who stopped following me? <laughs> Who stopped following me? Hey man, don't you tend to do that? If you, I mean, some of you probably, hopefully, most of you have never yeah, done that. Yeah. And so, and so what I'm saying is it can be a discouragement. And I don't picture Paul doing it. I always picture Paul as be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Don't worry, I'm not looking back. I'm going to follow Christ and you hook your wagon on. Hitch your wagon up to me if you want. But I ain't, I'm not turning around. Amen. And so, so what an opportunity. But like I said, that kind of uh, inter helps you kind of get to know a pastor. Maybe a little bit better. And where I stand. But also, really, that, that it's, it's, it's not just for pastors. I mean, really, we're all followers of Christ, and we're really all leaders. And it boils right down to it. Amen. Father, we sure are grateful, Lord. I pray that you continue, Lord, to help us to grow closer to you each and every day. And, Lord, a simple little message tonight, Lord, about following and about being a servant. And, Lord, I pray that you help us to be the best servants that we can. And Lord, it sure is easy to get wrapped up into this world, uh, Lord. But but we've seen some of the some of the characteristics we're to have, Lord, that we're to be like a husband, where our concern is to nurture and to produce fruit. And whether some will follow us and produce fruit with us, that's neither here nor there. 